Hi, good morning. It is Thursday. Uh, we are going to be talking about the plant of the week here at Rogers Gardens. Thank you so much for tuning in, waking up with us in the morning, uh, listening to us talk about plants, the thing that we're absolutely passionate about here. Um, we have a really amazing program going on. It is our hummingbird uh, summer program. It's officially started. Uh, so we have all different kinds of really cool hummingbird plants. We just had one just go right behind the cameras just now. <laughs> um, so the hummingbirds are super active. It's like they know what's going on. Uh, they're all here. Uh, it's a really, really fun time here in Rogers Garden. So if you see me looking off to the side, it's because I get really distracted by all the hummingbirds going around. I'm Sarah Smith. I'm a horticulturalist here at Rogers Gardens. Um, and let's talk about the plant of the week. So because we have hummingbird summer going on, uh, the different plants that I'm going to be bringing to you uh, every single Thursday is going to be hummingbird attracting plants. Uh, and I always say that hummingbirds have the best taste because they really like beautiful plants. Uh, so it's really kind of nice because everything they like is showy and beautiful. Um, and a lot of it's all very water wise too. So it's really kind of a great thing uh, that all these things once you get them established and some of them are even California natives uh, which is even better so uh, these are penstemums uh, I always feel like I say that wrong it's penstemums <laughs> there's an n on the end um, but uh, these are beautiful beautiful flowers the common name um, that I've heard a lot of people call them mostly back east I don't feel like people here use the common name as beard tongue uh, I do really find that here everybody really just kind of calls them penstemon uh, but we even have a California native one so these ones here here are not the California natives. This here is the California native. And I'm gonna show you how to clean them up too. So I grabbed one that kind of needs a little bit of TLC uh, so we can get into the care of how to take care of these. Uh, but they are a perennial plant, which is really amazing. They want full sun, but they can take some shade. So full sun, you're really gonna have your best luck with them, but partial shade, ooh, that was a hummingbird that just went by. <laughs> uh, partial shade uh, for at least like five hours of direct sunlight, they'll be happy. But if they're gonna get some like morning sun up to about maybe like two, three o'clock, that'll be fine. If they're gonna get afternoon sun, they'll be even happier with that because the afternoon sun around here tends to be a little more intense because the marine layer is typically burned off. Uh, but they're really, really showy for being a perennial plant. Um, I do find that after a while, I, I kind of treat them as tender perennial plants. After a while, they start to look a little big and kind of crazy and I wind up taking them out and putting a new one in. Uh, but you get a quite a few years off of them. I mean, I'm maybe a little bit more picky than the normal gardener and I'm a little spoiled because I work here, right? <laughs> so sometimes I take it out purely because I want a different color. I want the purple one instead. Uh, so they are a perennial plant. Um, these ones here, I really, really like this one. I picked this one up because I love this color. Midnight, isn't that beautiful? This one's so gorgeous. Uh, and this one is Bev uh, Jensen. Um, but they do come in all different kinds of colors. There's reds, there's pinks, there's purples. Uh, there's blue. Can you believe that this is a California native? This color is so amazing, this really beautiful blue color. Uh, so this one, uh, really, once you get it established, doesn't need a whole lot. So this is one that you see growing around here locally. Um, this one does really, really well, more in full sun than in partial shade, whereas these ones can handle a little bit of partial shade. They look like they're something that are particularly water hungry, but they're not. Once you get these established, they're very, very low water. Uh, and these are really good for that kind of cottagey look. And I think everybody soon that a cottage garden is something that needs uh, a particular amount of water, but really truly they don't. If you do it right here, there's so many beautiful things that are very, very uh, water wise and don't require a lot, especially once you get them established, uh, you can really cut them back uh, and they're really an easy plant to take care of. Um, what you wanna do with these is in August, you wanna cut them down a little bit. So you wanna cut them down to maybe about a third uh, to just kind of make sure that they have some foliage still, uh, they have some protection for the winter time. And then you're gonna really start seeing them really come back into uh, their like kind of happy spot probably around March, April is when you're gonna see that. And that's when, as it's starting to grow, you can kind of look at it and do some fine tuning once you see some new growth going on it. But this is what has what we call basal growth. So when you're looking at these, uh, they're very herbaceous. They never get woody. So that means that the stem stays very, very green all the way down. Uh, they don't get a lot of woodiness to them. And when you look in between the foliage, uh, you can see it has some growth there. So this is what we call that basal growth. Um, so you cut down to that. So when you're cutting 
cutting down to that two thirds uh, and leaving, uh, you wanna leave two thirds of the plant, cut down one third off of it. Uh, you're gonna cut down to a spot where you see that growth there and that's where the new growth is gonna come down. As they start to actually start doing some growth, you might wanna cut them down a little bit more. You wanna kind of fine tune and tweak them a little bit, but they have that very telltale, uh, very tubular flower uh, that the hummingbirds like. It's so funny because uh, what I find with these plants is when you look at them, they are so set to be pollinated by those hummingbirds because the hummingbirds will come and shove their whole entire head inside this flower, which is hilarious to watch. Uh, quite honestly. And you can see that the way that the stamens are inside, there's a little piece that comes down. And if I pinch it, you can kind of see it moving in there. Uh, it rubs up against their heads. So they get the pollen all over the top of their heads. And that's what's so funny when you see uh, all that kind of like dusty white pollen all over the top of the hummingbirds heads because they've been going around and eating. Uh, but the plant is completely set up to be pollinated by this. It's just amazing how mother nature works and has learned how to attract the thing that it needs and to use it to its advantage. Uh, so it's really fun to watch them come in and out of these. Uh, we all have them set up here in the front area. So when you first come into the very first customer service booth here, uh, whenever we're sitting here, I love watching the hummingbirds fly around and come in uh, and stuff that whole entire head of theirs <laughs> inside these uh, like they have no care in the world which is really amazing um, when it comes to fertilizing um, the only thing I really like to use on mine is the rose and flower fertilizer uh, it's just the granular one I use this on my roses I use this on most of my flowering plants uh, at home it's really easy it's just a granular you throw it down on the ground uh, you don't really even have to particularly mix it in I just kind of use my hose to mix it in when I water everything in uh, but this works really really well you want something that's going to encourage those blooms because this is such a full blooming beautiful plant you want to get as many blooms as possible so this is a really great one it's got that high middle number that's what you're always looking for when you're looking for something to encourage flowers is that middle number to be a higher number um it doesn't really particularly get a lot of pest problems um the couple of things that I tend to find is sometimes slugs and snails uh, can be an issue. Um, if you have a really overly wet garden, you're going to have a problem with slugs and snails anyways. Uh, because I hand water most of my plants and I've always been really particularly water wise, uh, I, I don't have a very wet garden. So I don't really have a large problem with a lot of slugs and snails. Um, but this is really great. This is pet safe. This is organic. Rogers has been organic for way over 10 years. I've been saying 10 years for a very long time now. So uh, this is an organic product that you can feel safe about putting down on the ground, uh, but this will help with the slug and snail problems. But if you have slugs and snails, think about your water and you probably need to dial that down a little bit because that's where they're thriving in very very wet very shady areas right so if you're having that problem it's probably because you're keeping the surface of your soil too moist uh, and you definitely want to cut that down and I know sometimes this kind of freaks everybody out but I always tell everybody go out at nighttime have a glass of wine so you don't feel so freaked out by it and pick all those slugs and snails and throw them away <laughs> you can always pick them up maybe wear gloves if that freaks you out too much but uh, it is really easy to keep that under control uh, using this too is really really helpful um, the other thing that I sometimes see on these is sometimes some caterpillar problems, but not the caterpillar caterpillars that you want for anything beautiful. It's usually just the little green ones that turn into nothing special. Uh, so I will find that occasionally I'll have that because they are so soft. Um, if I do have a caterpillar problem, the thing that I really like to use is the Monterey BT. I really like this product because this doesn't affect anything else. So this is not going to affect the bees and any of the ladybugs or anything else. Uh, it's something that the caterpillars eat and they can't survive through. Uh, you do want to look at your caterpillars and make sure that it's nothing fancy or beautiful but on these it's typically not like I said on these it's usually just the little green inchy worm kind of things that don't turn into anything pretty it's just a tiny little moth so it's something you definitely do want to take care of but I really don't even find I have that much of a problem with that either uh, so I find that these tend to be relatively pest free uh, sometimes a little bit of aphid here and there some insecticidal soap will work well for that uh, but they're really pretty easy and if you're keeping them really happy and then here they come there was just a bunch of them just now I wonder if they can hear them on the live stream when they come up like that it's so fun we have tons of bees too around right now there's a really beautiful big giant carpenter bee over here uh, that's been buzzing around on all the salvia so it's a really great time to come in right now morning activity tends to be when they're kind of at their prime so if you want to come in and see all the hummingbirds 
I suggest coming in in the morning. Uh, we have all the hummingbird plants all put together. So if you just stand there still for a second, you will see a hummingbird. They're all over the place right now, which is really amazing. We've got the Annas and the Allens mostly, but we have all kinds of beautiful posters and stuff of all the different types of hummingbirds uh, that you'll see here. So it's kind of cool to be able to look at them and identify them. Like right now, there's a little Anna right behind uh, the cameras there. Uh, the little chirping ones that you're hearing buzz by, those are typically the Allens. Uh, so we have a lot of different information we're gonna have the sea and sage autobahn society come to on july 16th they will be here they're really really fun to um <laughs> listen to and 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 see all the different things they have they have all kinds of beautiful books uh, they'll have all kinds of beautiful posters uh, a lot of people in that sea and sage that which is our local chapter of autobahn um, are really amazing photographers and will have really beautiful uh, photography of the hummingbirds it's so hard to get a picture of a hummingbird let me tell you i try all the time and it's so hard because they're so fast but they'll have all kinds of beautiful stuff uh, so that's a really fun thing bring your kids uh, walk around look at all the beautiful hummingbirds all the bees all the butterflies we have our native milkweed right now um, and we have lots of that going on we are still doing the native milkweed exchange program where if you bring in a tropical milkweed with the roots and everything intact we will give you a free native one uh, we have tons of videos with information about that so I definitely suggest checking that out if you have monarchs in your yard, uh, it's really, really fun. Uh, we have tons of uh, little monarch caterpillars all over some of the native milk. We were looking at it yesterday, even some chrysalises around uh, that we were checking out that are just absolutely beautiful. So there's so much fun activity going on here. Definitely come in. I know the kids are getting out of school, so it's a good time to bring them in as well. So we are live and I'll answer some questions. Oh, I was gonna show you real quick how to trim. So let's do that real quickly before we get in. So this gives you time to get your questions in there. Um, but I pulled this one because it looks a little scraggly. It needs a little help uh, with the um, the native ones. They tend to be a little bit more kind of wild, but that's kind of the appeal of it, right? Um, hi, little guy. Sorry, I just scared him away. All right, so deadheading. What you want to do with these is you definitely want to deadhead them. So when these are done and they're not making any more flowers, so when your top flowers here are pretty much done and spent, you definitely want to deadhead. You want to keep them cut back. One, it just keeps them tidy and beautiful looking, but that also helps the plant flower more. So I always tell everybody, you want to deadhead your plants because that way your, your plant thinks, okay, I need to continue to put out the flowers. If you let your plant go to seed and start setting a lot of seed, that's when it slows down because it thinks, okay, my job's done and I don't need to continually put out flowers. So keeping your plant deadheaded only, uh, not only helps them look more pretty, but it definitely helps them um, continue to put more stuff out. So what I would do with something like this is I'm looking at here and this is all done. I can tell there's no new flower buds on it. These are all spent out. So I wanna cut that, but I wanna cut it up to the point where I have some new growth happening. So you wanna cut just above that new growth. So now I cut that piece off right there and I now have this new stuff here. Now these are mostly done here on the ends too. There's not a whole lot going on there. Um, if I were at my house, I would not cut that off. Uh, I tend to be a little ruthless when I clean up plants here at the nursery uh, because I just want everything to really look particularly nice. But I look at something like this, the only flower I have on there is here and most of this is all done. I can go down and see that there's a little bit more flower there, but I'm gonna go, actually I'm gonna go down to this set all of that's new all of that bit right there is nice and new and that just makes it look so much more tidy right so you're going to cut that also too what i've really learned is i cut sometimes i do cut a little bit harder at home when i want to bring the plants in uh, and put them inside um, in a vase or something i have such a huge collection now <clears throat> especially because we sell so many beautiful ones of all these little bud vases like all over my house that have all different kinds of really beautiful things in there um, that i've cut from the garden so even something like this if i want to go okay i'm going to cut that maybe clean it up maybe add it to a couple of beautiful sunflowers or something like that that I have growing in the garden. I would cut that piece up right next to the nice new little stuff. Not only does that encourage the new stuff on the end here to flower, um, but it just looks tidy. You don't have that big blunt end and that's what we wanna stay away from. Uh, no blunt ends on the plants because uh, they're not gonna do anything. So you always cut right above the new growth. And now that I've tidied that up, isn't that so much nicer? And I just go in and kind of clean up a little bit 
and now it's a lot more pretty and a lot more tidy looking. So keeping them deadheaded uh, is definitely important and that's something you'll continue to do through the whole year. You'll do your big pruning um, in August and then just like little kind of cute stuff here and there throughout the year. Um, and then when they start really coming in, that's a good time to kind of look at them and give them like a little bit of final kind of fine tuning usually in March. So if we have any questions, I will answer those questions for you. If you came into this and it's not live any longer, you can still write your questions down below and we'll answer those for you as well. Uh, so you can get all of those answered. And if you know any of those hummingbird people in your life, someone who has a lot of hummingbird feeders in their garden, uh, definitely tag them in this because you want to make sure that you have not only hummingbird feeders, but true uh, nectar plants for the hummingbirds to drink from too. So they have a kind of buffet for the hummingbirds essentially. So is there any questions that I can answer? Yes. Is the native California native also called a pentasimmon? Yes, it is. And this variety is called Margarita Bop, which I think is so funny. I love that name, um, Margarita Bop. But there are a couple of different types of California native ones um, as well, but I love the color of this. Uh, this is the most common one that you'll see. When you look at our native plants, they will usually have a sticker like this on them or something similar to this so you know that they're native. And we keep those in a particular section. It's over kind of by uh, the amphitheater that we have here in the big uh, waterfall. So uh, you can find those there. <laughs> They're starting to come. It's starting to get to be that time. Uh, it's breakfast for the hummingbirds. But yeah, they'll have this um, there. So this variety is called Margarita Bob. Um, once you get this established, very low water. Um, when you really want to kind of concentrate on supplemental watering, it's at first just to get it established. Once it's established, you don't want to water it too much. Uh, it's very counterintuitive of how we typically guard because you don't want to start putting tons of water on it in the summertime because California native plants don't get water in the summer. <laughs> you want to do supplemental watering in the springtime here and there, uh, but it's definitely something that once you get established, you kind of leave it alone. Uh, maybe a little so to, a bit of supplemental water here and there, water to get it established, but once it's established, uh, they're pretty easy plants for sure. Any other questions? Yes, besides hummingbirds, do you see monarch butterflies flying around? Uh, yes, they're not particularly attracted to these. They will go to them. Um, they're a little deep for them. I see tons and tons of bees. There's tons of bees all over me right now. Um, but uh, they will go to them to a degree. They'll, they will go to um, plants that have longer... Um, flowers like this, the, the tubular flowers, because they do have a particularly long uh, drinking apparatus. I forget what that's called all of a sudden, um, that they can kind of unfurl, but um, they will come to them a little bit, but they're not going to be um, super attracted to this. Usually they're looking for more shallow flowers, but this is a great one to mix in with things like your um, milkweed and stuff, because it is very attractive and very pretty and similar water requirements and sun requirements. Um, and that will help kind of hide that sometimes Kind of scraggly looking milkweed and into that kind of cottagey feel so this is a great one to plant with that as a companion plant for sure so um for now we'll end with the questions but if you have any more questions and you watch this later go ahead and add those down below uh thank you so much for joining me it's always so much fun to talk to you about uh the different plants that we have going on here and the different things we have going on and i love this time of year when all the hummingbirds are just absolutely going crazy all over the place um make sure that you sign up for our email list um on that email list you'll know about all the new things going on you'll know about all the fun things the events that we have going on here the different live streams we have going on we'll talk to you about plants we'll talk to you about uh, how to conserve water uh, we'll talk to you about father's day gifts all kinds of fun things like that here uh, at rogers gardens usually tuesdays and thursdays and then on some fridays every other fridays we talk about all the different amazing house plants we have some really beautiful fun house plants uh here at rogers so we always will talk to you about something special about that as well uh so stay safe and stay sane and happy gardening everybody bye